is Laura London, and you're listening to a special quarantine edition of Speaking of Young. I started this new series in the spring of 2020 during the coronavirus lockdown when I decided to spend my extra time at home interviewing some of my friends about the interesting work that they do. Kelly Carlin studied communications at the University of California, Los Angeles, and later went on to earn a master's degree in Jungian psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara. She is the producer of the critically acclaimed Showtime series, The Green Room with Paul Provenza, host of the popular podcast, Waking from the American Dream, and has interviewed dozens of iconic and popular comedians on her Sirius XM radio program, The Kelly Carlin Show, airing the first and third Fridays of the month on Comedy Greats Channel 94. Her solo show, detailing her experiences growing up with her famous father, Grammy Award-winning comedian George Carlin, became a best-selling memoir. A Carlin Home Companion, Growing Up with George, was published by St. Martin's Press in 2015. Through her public speaking and workshops, she has inspired thousands of artists, business leaders, writers, and truth seekers to question the status quo within their lives and culture. Kelly proudly serves on the Board of Trustees for the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Protection of Free Expression and the Board of Industry Advisors for the National Comedy Center. After receiving certification as a professional co-active coach from the Coaches Training Institute, she founded Women on the Verge, a year-long coaching program that supports women who are ready to make deep, long-lasting changes within and without so they can finally be valued, paid, and recognized. Kelly has spent the last two years deepening into her depth psychology roots through her dream-tending training with Stephen, a name I can't pronounce. Help me out here. Eisenstadt? Eisenstadt. Okay. Finally unpacking James Hillman and archetypal imaginal psychology in order to find understanding of its stance in a clearer way. She says it has become her guiding light in all areas of her life. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, July 15th, 2020, through the magic of Skype. Hi, Kelly. Hey, Laura. I'm surprised you don't know Stephen. He founded Pacific Graduate Institute. You know, here's the thing. I don't know much about Pacifica. When I first started the podcast, I wanted to focus on the classically trained Jungian analysts who were trained in Zurich. And I knew about Pacifica, but I thought that they were archetypal and that they gave degrees, master's degrees and PhDs, but they, they weren't a training institute. They weren't training Jungian analysts, right? Yeah, they're, they don't, no, they're not a Jungian analyst training institute. No, but uh, uh, most of the foundational professors there mm-hmm. uh, went through that, and certainly Stephen did. And Stephen uh, was both a student of Hillman and Joseph Campbell and goes to Zurich every year to the Aranos, uh conference. Oh, okay. So he's very much a part of that world. Um, that's where his foundations are. Um, and they they give PhDs in uh, clinical psychology with an emphasis in Jungian, and then they have PhDs in depth psychology, masters in counseling psychology, which I did, uh, PhDs in mythology, mm-hmm. and uh, they've also done some PhDs in uh, somatic, uh, well, the depth psychology with a somatic emphasis. So they've got a, quite an interesting array there. But right now they have a lot, a ton of amazing online certificate stuff and um and some actually some degrees online too so and of course we're all online now but (laughs) right but yeah i really encourage you if you want some introductions there's some good conversation to be had by some of the people who uh walk those halls of pacifica i I think it you you'd enjoy the conversations a lot so has it changed since you did you go there physically and take classes I did. I graduated in 2004. Uh, So I went in 2001 and uh, got my master's in counseling psychology. I was torn between either mythology or that. I decided to go with the slightly 
um, more practical counseling psychology, it was like, well, I'll always be able to get licensed in a state if mm-hmm. I have the master's degree. And, you know, some part of me, you know, my dad had always said, you know, always have a plan B, even though my dad never had a plan B, but you know, <laughs> I was supposed to have a plan B. <laughs> right. Uh, and so I did, and I went and, and was an intern for a couple of years as a therapist and knew it was not my calling. Mm-hmm. It was not Thing. I'd been a therapist since I was three years old in my own family. Right. And I was like, I cannot handle this. Um, so um, yeah, I physically went there and um, ch- it changed my life. It's it's still my home, uh, very much so for, for my psyche and uh, two beautiful, beautiful, stunning campuses mm-hmm. in Montecito, Carpinteria, uh, California. And has it changed? Has the program there changed since you were there? I would imagine that it has when I was there, they had just gotten their accreditation, which mm-hmm. was a huge, huge thing for them because that really meant that they were an actual accredited higher education yeah. institution. So they had more hoops to jump through. So I was there just after that main change. It was much more, I mean, when Pacifica first started, Stephen used to take everyone in the school who was like, you know, 25 people or whatever it was. And they would go every year to a different place, either Greece or Hawaii and study with shamans or, you know, go to the Eleusian mysteries mm-hmm. or the Slippian mm-hmm. temple, you know, I mean, it was much more of a myth, um, depth psychology adventure kind of a place. Um, and then they got much more rigorous, of course, And when I went there, it was half of my training. The first year was much more imaginal depth and basics foundations of Jungian stuff. And then the second year was all state requirements. Like, you know, you had to do all the stuff that was required in order to get a master's in counseling psychology so that you could get the licensing eventually. So there was a lot of kind of non-Pacifica type classes we had to take. Right. So, but you went there because you wanted to study psychology, not because you wanted to be a therapist. Exactly. I went there because two reasons. Uh, They had, they have Joseph Campbell's archives there. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, Joseph Campbell been introduced to me when I was 21 by my, or 20 or 1920 or 21 by my therapist back in the day, uh, a basic psychoanalytic therapist in Westwood, California. And so the power of myth uh, really just opened up my mind in a profound way to archetypes and all of that. And I knew I had entered, it felt like I'd entered a sacred school when I learned that stuff in my early 20s. And then the other reason Uh, And then my sister-in-law from my first marriage, she was one of the original students at Pacifica. And so during my 20s, when I was in the mess of my first marriage to her half brother and doing a lot of drugs and very, very lost as a as a as a young woman, she was off getting her at the time masters there. And she was one of the original ones who was doing counseling services. And it was a, a much smaller group. Like I said, they would go to Greece and places like that. So I knew of the place. And then I had read uh, after um, I had left my first husband and in my 30s, I was doing a lot of my own healing work, trying to figure out how the hell did I get stuck in that marriage for 11 yeah. years. <laughs> and I had read Maureen Murdoch's um, Father's Daughter book. And um, it just, you know, landed in my lap like a big holy shit. Um and knew that Maureen uh, taught at Pacifica. And I, um, uh, that was fascinating to me, but I was, uh, my mom died in 97. And when my mom died, I had a huge spiritual awakening. Um, like just, it, I describe it, I talk a lot about this in my book, mm-hmm. but I had a huge awakening and um, knew that I had to step into my my craft and my path, which I really believed was becoming a solo show artist, telling my, uh, telling my story on stage. Spalding Gray um, was one of my, one of the people who really inspired me to, to get up on a stage and just kind of 
um, pour my story out with all my with all my neurosis and all my insanity. And so I started to do that, and it made my dad really uncomfortable. And and yet I knew. I, I did the show a couple of times and I knew between my mom's memorial, which was standing in front of a group of people kind of owning my human experience in front of them. And in my solo show also, I, I knew that I wanted to be in front of people um, and that I wanted to understand the human journey on a very deep level. Yeah. And I started looking into PhD programs around town I had some big professors at UCLA and USC who were willing to take me into their programs, but none of them really fit. And because there was no spiritual aspect to it. And, and I went up to Pacifica and I really didn't know which program, but I, like I said, I knew that the counseling psychology would be at least a plan B for me. And so I, I went up there to orientation and, um, which they would do like once every few months, maybe once a month. And it would get a chance to sit with other students who were interested. And some professor who taught there would kind of walk you through, you know, what it was. And then you'd get to walk on the campus and stuff like that. And I walk into the room and the professor that's there to orient us and kind of be the, our tour guide that day is Maureen Murdoch. And, um, being a student of synchronicity, yeah. I thought, wow, okay. So, uh, and Maureen became, uh, who people who read my memoir will see, uh, she becomes uh, a touchstone for me throughout my whole experience and a big part of my healing at Pacifica, um, my personal healing, which I now look back on and really understand that it was a healing uh, with my relationship to the feminine. Mm. Yeah. So was Pacifica, did it start out being what it is? Was it something else? Or was it it's always a counseling center? Okay, um, outside of UCSB in that little community there. Mm -hmm. um, and they were doing peer counseling. That's how it started with Steven Eisenstadt. And oh, he okay. was, he was then, uh, you know, he would also have people come down to lecture and stuff. And <laughs> Joseph Campbell would come down from Esalen. Mm -hmm. And give talks and stuff. And, um, and, and then they ended up getting, I think, some space inside of Santa Barbara, which was more about some classes they started teaching and the counseling center. And then they bought the, um, they bought the estate in Montecito. They, they got some patrons and bought the estate in Montecito, which was the first campus. And then they really started seriously as a, as an institute there. Mm -hmm. And that was, there, it's been 40 plus years that they've been around. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned Joseph Campbell, and I think he died in the 1980s, if, if I'm I not think mistaken. so. Yeah. So, but I heard you mention that you watched his videos on PBS. You saw his shows on PBS, and I did too with Bill Moyers. Yep. Yep. And I was so affected by that. And you and I are very close in age. Um, I think there's only a couple years difference between us. And so when those shows were airing on PBS, I think PBS would replay them every so often. I wanted to see them over and over again. So I would go to my local library and I would check out the VHS uh, tapes yep. Yep. and I would watch them over and over and over again. And this was before I was into Jung. This was right before I, I got interested in Jung. So um, you knew that you didn't want to be a therapist. And I could totally relate to that. I have never had the desire to be a therapist. I've been in therapy most of my life. <laughs> but yep. I always knew that I didn't want to do that. I know myself enough to know that that wasn't my, as you said, it's not my calling. But I wanted to understand myself and the people around me, and I still do, and I'm still learning. So tell us what now you're doing with what you learned at Pacifica. With your, you have a master's degree, but then you also went on and became a certified life coach. What, what is that? So after I um, uh, realized I didn't want to be a therapist, I, I knew I wanted to work with high functioning creatives. And 
uh, although I'm very interested in my own psyche and the human psyche and the human journey and really understanding, I'm fascinated by transformation. And I love being a witness to it. And so I went and uh, got some training. I went to their training, got certified, and even went to the leadership program at Coaches Training Institute. They teach all over the world. And they're one of the oldest coaches training programs uh, in, in, in the world. And uh, they really, their program really stands on the shoulders of uh, the human potential movement, like all the people who founded CTI are people who, you know, we're at, we're at SLN who have done the work, who've, but who've been with all these teachers, yeah. you know, studied young, who've studied it all. I mean, they really get it. And they had an incredible way of translating all of that into coaching. And, um, and I loved it because it was a way to be in relationship with a client, kind of the basic, stance you take as a coach is that everyone is creative, resourceful, and whole. There's no pathology. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I love about depth psychology, too, that pathology is actually just a window into psyche. You know, it's not about brokenness or or woundedness, or if it is about brokenness and woundedness, that's another metaphor to sit with. But um, so I just loved that I didn't have to be fixing or rescuing or any of that because Mm -hmm. That was, unfortunately, um, my personal pathology was, let's rescue and fix the world. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, p- part of it is is honoring that, um, like you said, you know, those of us who've been in therapy or have been in a coaching relationship know the power of having someone who's willing to be your Virgil, to walk with you on the path, to illuminate aspects of self that you can't see. Um, And so that's really, that's really how I see my work is helping people notice and see and pull out of the shadow, you know, either old scripts that are running them or aspects and powers that they have put in the basement that are actually their gifts um, or their quote unquote superpowers and to help them see the truth of themselves, which is all of these parts of themselves are, are here and it's all part of their resourcefulness. And, um, and so I, I loved the, the coaches training because it, it gave me a, a solid stance and a solid way to work with people and actually tools and techniques that really, um, are very, uh, are, are, are not, part of it, there's a little bit of depth work in it. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of depth coaching out there too now, which is really beautiful. And I've studied some of that stuff through books and stuff, but, um, and, and I, you know, and I, and the thing is, I'm really one of the gifts I had as a therapist and as a coach and as a teacher and all of that is I just have a way of creating a space where helps where I help people go deep very quickly. And, um, and I really do think that that's connected to, in a strange way, um, kind of my, my being my father's daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, there's something about truth telling and truth seeing and being willing to sit with truth that I learned from day one by being at my father's knee and at my mother's knee too. My mother was a natural healer and she was a, um, a, a big person in AA and a, a, a woman sponsor and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, and the program, um, she could hold really beautiful, unconditional space for others. My mom could. Um, so I, I really see my work now as, I mean, even in my podcast, which I've, I'm about to, to start up again, which yeah. I'm excited. I've taken a bit of a hiatus from it. Um, but, um, I really see kind of my job is to just be looking through certain lenses and perspectives and to sit with the truth of what it means to be a human on this human journey, um, and give people permission. And and that's what I feel like my solo show and my memoir and my storytelling work, my personal storytelling work has always done is to give people permission to 
to let their humanity come forward and, and be in the room with them and others and not see it as something to be ashamed of or sinful or broken or wounded. So, um, so it, 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 you know, in, in my late fifties now, um, I see it's all kind of the same dance and the same work, no matter what I do. Mm -hmm. I'm really seeing that it's just in my bones that, um, I am a truth seeker and hopefully most, of the time, a, a truth speaker. <laughs> you mentioned the phrase, you said holding space. Would you tell the listeners what you mean by that? So there might be some people who are not familiar with that term. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's a way in which um, we don't feel like we belong in the world. We feel like we need to uh, pretzel shape ourselves into the right shape so that the world will accept us. Um, and we get these messages very early in, in, in childhood. Um, the first no, we are told, uh, is really yeah. the first time you go, oh, I'm not fitting here. I need to change my shape. And so we were bombarded, bombarded culturally from family, through education, uh, through advertising, uh, through everything. Um, and especially women, men too, absolutely. But I am a woman and I know my own experience of it. Women are especially bombarded by literally what shape we're allowed to take in the world uh, in order to be accepted. So there's a lot of conditional acceptance going on. Uh, you know, you are successful if you do this. You are beautiful if you look like this. You are good if you think these thoughts. And the holding space is really about an invitation um, a, an opening inside of a relationship. So when I sit with a client or if I sit in a workshop or if I am even giving a speech um, or even on my podcast, wh mm -hmm. wherever I am, I am, I am hopefully putting out a welcome mat to the other, to the person, to the people and saying, um, you can take your mask off here, and I'm going to hold space. I'm going to hold the space that this is a safe space for us to just show up in our humanity here. And um, and one of the reasons that therapy is such a powerful path of healing is because it is a very intimate experience of coming into an actual room. Nowadays, it's online, but... Um, and it's what we call um, uh, the temenos of the space. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a room. It's a space where we take off our personas and can just bring all of ourselves to it. And I think through my own, uh, you know, I was told very kind of early on at Pacifica and then in my, into my coach's training that my leadership, kind of my superpower is my own authenticity, my own willingness to be raw and naked, um, whether it's emotionally or with truth in the room. Mm -hmm. And so I just, there, there's an actual feeling in the room that you can create where you're not and I really is a welcome mat. I really see it as that. Like, welcome, come, come sit in the space here where yeah. you, um, as Mary Oliver says, right? Uh, you do not have to be good, mm. you know, or crawl a hundred miles on your knees. Um, that space. A safe container. Yes. Yeah. So what, for again, for the listeners, what would you say is the difference between being in therapy and working with a life coach? I think it's a continuum. Uh, and it really, you know, being in therapy is a big, is a huge, huge bucket of things. There's so many different kinds of therapy. Right. But I think in general, therapy happens when we have some emotional or mental symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, we can no longer feel like we can function on some level. Some major aspect of our life 
is not working because of either anxiety or depression or maybe a personality disorder or schizophrenia or something like that or it's or a relational thing right so it's either you can't get your work done or you can't be in relationship well you can't function and it tends to be kind of more crisis oriented and and all of that and therapy then really points backwards to the past and um and says you know let's repair some of the bad messages or some of the trauma you've had. I mean, there's got, there's all this trauma work that goes on now and there's all these different modalities to work on that stuff. Um, and you know, I mean really cognitive behavioral all the way, you know, which is very rational science oriented all the way to the depth psychologies, you know, Freudian young and imaginal and, and all that kind of stuff and everything in between. Um, whereas coaching in general, the coaching stance is, where are you today? And what do you want for tomorrow? Where are you going? And how can we help create some systems, some structure, a mindset, a perspective that will help you to move towards that thing you want to move towards? And of course, you know, these days, I think a, a lot of therapists depending on their client, do both. I mean, if you work cognitive behaviorally with someone who's having panic attacks, you're very much in some ways their coach. <laughs> you're their anxiety coach is what you are because you're helping them function today to move towards, you know, their their better future. And, and obviously all of it's about moving towards, quote unquote, a better future. But in general, that's how it breaks up is like, oh, you know, you work on family dynamics and psychodynamics the relational aspect of things in therapy, you get remothered, you get refathered, you know, that's all the depth psychology stuff. And then the coaching is, you know, oh, so you want to write a book, or you want to lose 10 pounds or whatever. Um, my approach, you know, as it is through CTI, and just my own depth psychology training, is, you know, I do a little of both, you know, I, I help people go deep, my program, women on the verge right now, some of it is looking backwards. We look into the past. We see that where the narratives were built about what it means to be a woman or a girl, what our relationship is with the feminine archetype, usually the mother or the main caregiver early in our life, and then our relationship with the masculine, uh, the father archetype, um, you know, whoever that was in, the, in that capacity in your life, and see, and see, you know, what's what are we ready to shed in those ideas about who we think we are with those people and the messages we got and who do we want to be now with it? Um, and so there's a little bit of looking back and digging in, but only really is information. Um, and what I offer also then is an active practice about helping people create new relationships with the feminine and the masculine uh, through imaginal practices, altar work, meditation, active imagination, all that kind of stuff. Um, and helping them remother and refather themselves. Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So it doesn't sound all that similar to Jungian analysis. Did you ever, were you ever in analysis? I, yeah, it was required when I was going through Pacifica to be in therapy. And so I went to um, a Jungian here in LA and, and was with him on and off uh, until a few years ago. So what is was he a Jungian analyst or a Jungian psychotherapist? He was a Jungian analyst. He ran uh, the training program at the LA Jung Institute. Oh, okay. So... Um, with the coaching, that is something that you do one on one. And in when I was reading the intro, it said it was a year long program. Is that typically how that works? Uh, it can work in any way people want. It's what I like. Uh, this work is deep work. And yeah. it takes yeah. time. As we know, it's all about peeling the onions. Yeah. And it's not a, you know, a a quick fix. I mean, I'm taking people through the heroine's journey. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, okay. I'm using a mythological template to help them 
understand and heal themselves. I'm teaching them about the unconscious. I'm teaching them about the importance of, of that work and that encounter. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and so it, it, it takes time to be in relationship with people and it takes time to unpack all that material. It sure does. Yeah. So, um, I felt that a year was a good time to do it. The coaching I do is both in small groups, um, small pods, two or three people, and then also some one-on-one work. Um, and then I also, we also have a, just a big, a, a community of women who are going through the program. I have some people who are in the first year of it. I have other women who have gone through the first year who are around for the second year, mm-hmm. uh, who are still getting support, who are part of the community. So we have some community wide calls a couple of times a month where we just gather in community um, and celebrate you know, our wins and, um, have any, if people have any questions about the content I bring, I'm kind of a curator when it comes to content. Um, I, you know, I'm, you know, I, if if your listeners know about, um, brain pickings, Maria Popova, who's like this incredible curator of things. And I just so, um, I so love her and respect her. Um, but I've always, you know, been a person who's read a book or had an experience and then turned to my own personal community and say, Oh my God, have you heard about Byron Katie? Or, Oh my God, there's, you know, there's this woman called Jean Houston or, uh, you know, whoever, uh, or Buddhism. I'm also practicing Buddhist for years. So I'm bringing all these teachers and their ideas and practices and tools and introducing my clients to their work you know, obviously giving them access to it. Um, I buy Maureen Murdoch's Heroine's Journey book for everyone and have them read it throughout the year so we can unpack it together. Um, I have that and, book, actually. Yeah. I got it, the, that was one of the first books I got. That It was an old, it, it was published quite some time ago, right? It was. And it definitely, I think she's got a new edition coming out actually this oh, year nice. because it it does need some updating because it's very much uh, a female baby boomer perspective mm-hmm. on on women and the disillusionment. But there's a lot of women out there who have taken her ideas and expanded them into kind of a broader conversation about what yeah. it means to be um, the psychological journey of the, the feminine, which is really what Maureen talks about. Um, I've also recently discovered um, a great book called The Virgin's Promise. Um, God, I can't remember her name right now. Um, and another one um, called The uh, Jane Eyre's Sisters by Bauer, which is also some other feminine narratives. Um, the Virgin's Promise is a is really a screenplay book, but she's amazing. Oh my God, Laura, you would have such a great conversation with her. <laughs> Well, I'll have links to these books in the show notes. I'll find them after we we're done. And I'll I'll put links to them on the episode page, The Virgin's Promise. Yeah, and I can't remember her name right now. But she's yeah, she's a a, she's a a screenwriter consultant. And she takes movies and shows how, um, you know, the hero's journey, mythologically is about the hero, which is a masculine protagonist. Uh, not male necessary, but holds the masculine and it leaves the security and safety of the mother complex as Joseph Campbell would say, Mm -hmm. and goes out into the world and then has an encounter, you know, allies and ogres and battles and all that kind of stuff. And then has an, uh, uh, an encounter with the deep feminine, the dark feminine and, and grabs some treasure and through his escapades and adventures, you know, claim some treasure and then comes back to the homeland, the motherland uh, with this treasure to enhance uh, the homeland. And then, um, and of course has secured the safety of the homeland. So it's very much about the masculine finding its own identity apart from the mother complex. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Virgin promise is about the feminine protagonist, once again, not female necessarily, because the the 40 year old virgin is one she uses. Um, It's about the feminine living inside of a patriarchal, uh, the father system, and living within the community and having to find her 
the courage to express herself authentically, to show her authentic self to community, to risk being exiled by it, and in the end, transforming community because of it. Mm. So she stays within the community. um, And there's a lot of examples. Uh, She gives Bend It Like Beckham, Shakespeare in Love. Um, she must give over a dozen examples of this um, this particular type of storyline. And I discovered this last year as I was in the middle of my first year working with Women on the Verge and was just so excited to find this other narrative. You know, Maureen's narrative is great, but it is a psychological inner kind mm-hmm. of thing. Right. And, right. and I hadn't. I, I had applied it in some ways. I wrote my uh, thesis at Pacifica on uh, Demeter and Persephone and, and mother daughter grief. It was about my losing my mother early, you know, in my thirties. Um, but I had not really, I couldn't, I couldn't really find my own template of what I had been experiencing in my life about feeling afraid to express myself authentically in my father's world. And, um, and really the last 12 years, my, my dad died in 2008 is when I've kind of lived this right. <laughs> looking back on it. Now I yeah. realize, Oh, mm-hmm. fascinating. I entered the world of comedy, which I'd never been a part of. I brought my personal truth to it. You know, my, my feminine take on my human journey to my dad's fan base, uh, which was in his way, you know, in some ways similar to the metaphor of his kingdom. And, and, and there was an incredible um, sense of acceptance and people seeing me and being able to see more of my father. So there was a transformation in some way of the quote unquote kingdom. Uh, for those who encountered me and my and my story, so um, it's 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 been a real revelation for me, and so I bring that narrative also to my work with women, because I know so many of us feel stifled or unseen or um, handless in our in our lives. And that's what the the women on the verge work is about is I really help women who've reached a point in their life, a transition point. Um, maybe they're empty nesters, maybe they're at 25 years into a career or 10 years into a career, mm-hmm. they're divorcing, maybe they've had a health scare, whatever that point where we are asked by life um, you know, that great Peggy Lee question, is this all there is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I offer to them, come, come with me, come, come, let's, let's go digging, let's go searching, let's go. Let me, let me show you how to look through these mythological lenses, these archetypal lenses. Let's do some deep imaginal psyche work through active imagination. Um, and you know, let's find out this authentic self that you are wanting to express now, whatever that newest version of that is. Let's help give her feet to stand on and um, a voice to speak through. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. And you mentioned drugs, and I wanted to talk a little bit about addiction and psychotropic medication. And I was wondering if you would share with us what your stance is on those things, since you've been through them yourself, I've been through them myself. um, I'd like to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, Well, you know, I think plant based medication and plant based experiences are very potent. And we are finding they are also extremely deeply healing and therapeutic. I'm reading right now Michael Pollan's um, How to Change Your Mind book for dream tending. I'm in uh, dream tending year two with uh, Steven Eisenstadt and um, reading about the use of uh, 
uh, LSD and these other psychotropic drugs um, for healing and therapy. Uh, you know, I unfortunately got connected to cocaine. I grew up in the late 70s. My, my coming of age years, I was 15 in 1978. Started smoking pot when I was 14. Grew up here in Hollywood, L.A., access to everything, no parenting, really, the laissez parenting, as I say in my book. And we had, you know, lots of privilege here in the West Side in Hollywood. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, my dad used to talk about he, my dad and mom both used a lot of cocaine. My mom got sober when I was 12. My dad walked away from that stuff around when I was 14 or 15. I think he may st- still have used a little bit on the road. But, um, but, you know, cocaine is this very crazy narcissistic drug that really hijacks your nervous system in a very particular way. Mm -hmm. And um, a friend of mine, Rick Overton talks about the difference between smoking weed and doing Coke. When you smoke weed, you take a hit and you pass the joint. It's the biggest pleasure you have is to take a hit of the weed and pass the joint. Whereas the minute you get your cocaine, you're hiding it from every single friend around mm-hmm. you. <laughs> and I think that really does hold the kind of the 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 metaphoric uh, uh, relationship of psyche to both of those things. And I think also, you know, as far as medication goes with um, other psychological issues, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, I think if you're working with a good therapist and a good psychiatrist um, and you uh, – need some stuff for clinical depression or anxiety or some other kind of psychotic type of things, Um, you know, bipolar, things like that. I mean, it's, it's a lifesaver. It's absolutely a lifesaver for people. Is it perfect? No. Is it, is it, is it over are are pills being handed out for depression and anxiety and sleep right now at by doctors who don't know what they're doing? Yes. Uh, Very troubling. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, um, but there's a time and a place for all of that stuff. It can be very therapeutic. Um, I have been lucky enough. I've never really needed medication. I've made my way through panic attack disorder for quite a long time without medication. I had Xanax for a few weeks to actually get me out of my house after a deep, deep trench into agoraphobia. Once it got me out of the house, I I went off of it. Um, But I have a lot of friends who are clinically depressed who take medication, and I encourage them to make sure they're they're on their meds. Um, So, yeah, I think it's, you know, like everything, it's about educating yourself and getting good advice. And, and, you know, it's not black or white. It just Mm -hmm. isn't. Mm -hmm. And so as far as addiction is concerned, what was your experience with overcoming your addiction? I I like to share those stories with the listeners who might be in it and not know a way out. Yeah, you know, my mom, when I was 11, ages like nine to nine to to the summer, I turned 12. uh, My mom was, uh, she'd been an alcoholic my whole life. And then she got very much into her disease and um, was down to 87 pounds and it was almost dead. She was addicted to, to Valium and cocaine and alcohol and went into a center uh, here in LA. This is before there were Betty Ford. Um, She went in, she went into what a mental ward where they were also just starting to do actual addictive type of program. So she was in a program there. It was called CDC chemical dependency center at St. John's hospital in Santa Monica. And she went willingly or, yeah, well, the doctor basically said you have 10 days oh. to two to live. She was down to 87 pounds. She okay. had stopped. Okay. Um, and she was pretty sure she was going to die in there. And they weren't sure if she, they weren't sure. Um, they had her on anti convulsants and stuff because of the Valium. It's very hard. You know, they had to wean her off of it. She made it through and she went to AA. So very, uh, you know, starting at age 12, my mother was in AA meetings all day long. It saved her life. Mm -hmm. AA saved her life. Mm -hmm. 
she went with, uh, and became a sponsor and became very proactive as a volunteer, uh, saving, helping people save their own lives um, for about five years. Um, and then after about five years, I'd say AA is a place where some people, um, it can, it can become just as much of a crutch like the drugs can to anything yeah. else. There's a, there's a time where you actually need to do some work on yourself. Um, and AA used to be very anti-therapy back in the day. And, you know, there's a lot of versions of AA, but community is essential. Yes. And then for me, I was a, Clearly, I was an addict as a teenager, but no one uh, knew, you know, really. <laughs> it was the 70s. Uh, and then in my early 20s with this husband, my first husband, we did a lot of cocaine. And then at age like 20, 23, 24, I just knew uh, he and I got married when I was 22. And I just knew I had to be done with it. He was still very much an addict. He ended up going to rehab at some point. Um, and staying sober, but he was what they called a white knuckler. He wasn't really doing the work. He was also had, I think, a narcissistic personality disorder. Mm-hmm. So too. were you using w- after your mom got sober? Oh, yeah, that's when I started using. I okay. was 12 when my mom got sober. I started using at age 14. And and she knew? Uh, she knew to a point. My dad knew. My mom was afraid that if she laid down the law – she would, I would reject her like she had right. rejected her mother. Okay. And my dad was George Carlin. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, he was, uh, we were sharing weed. You yeah. know, he would buy an ounce of weed and he would give me a quarter ounce. Um, my parents' philosophy was if you're at home at our house doing it, at least we know you're safe. Yeah. And we can keep an eye on you. The problem was I was not at home. I mean, I was at home doing it, but I was also everywhere else in LA yeah. doing it. And I was getting in cars with people who were doing it. And I'm lucky to be alive. Yeah, um, I feel the but, same way. Yeah. But all of our parents during that time, there were no parents in the house. There was no parenting going on. Uh, my mother tried. My mother tried from day one with me. My dad always fought her on it. So I, I always got mixed messages about all that stuff. But I did have within me a limiter. I always knew what was too much. I never did. I never did LSD because I watched my dad go through a very, very bad trip when I was about eight years old. I never took pills because my mother had been addicted to Valium and I just didn't know what pills were. I took a couple of Quaaludes, things like that, but I never took Bennies and, mm-hmm. you know, downers and all that kind of stuff. Um, I smoked a lot of pot and then I, you know, then I got into cocaine. Um, and, and then I ended up weaning myself off of the Coke and really I started healing myself. I saw that my addiction wasn't so much the drugs, but it was the people. And I started going to Al-Anon and adult children of alcoholics Mm -hmm. and, um, and CODA, codependent, no more codependent anonymous, which are all things that looking back on it when I was, 12 years old and my mom got sober, I really wish they had put me in Alateen. You know, if they'd put me in Alateen, my life probably would have been different because I would have been educated about how to take care of myself and uh, boundaries, healthy boundaries and all of that. And but I just, I just want to jump in here and mention to people, these programs are all free and yes. they're open to everyone. Yes. And all they are in up and be willing to say, um, I think I belong here. I'm not sure, but I think I belong here. And they are in every city throughout the yeah. world. Throughout the world. You can go on Google Al-Anon, A-L-A-N-O-N, Al-Anon, and, um, or Adult Children of Alcoholics, or CODA, Codependence Anonymous, or Alcoholics Anonymous, Narco- NA, Narcotics Anonymous, there's Overeaters, there's Debtors Anonymous, there's, and the thing, the great thing about AA, um, and the hardest thing about AA, uh, is that there's this thing called, or, or all of the anonymous programs, is there's this thing called the higher power part. <laughs> yep. And that's, all of my atheist friends and atheist people I know or people who grew up and who are uh, unhealed Catholics or unhealed Christians or whatever, they're still wounded by it. Um, they, they can't, they can't buy into that part. And 
this is where the Jungian psychology comes in because it's not about a God. It's about realizing that your ego does not know everything, Mm -hmm. that there's something bigger than the ego. Uh, Jung calls it the self with a capital S. It's a, it's the part that is, you know, holds both the unconscious self and the conscious mind and is also connected to the, you know, the wider consciousness, collective consciousness and all of that. It's the part of us that is just bigger than our little decision making mind every day. And that is the biggest gift of the program is really coming to grips with your own ego. And that's what therapy does in the end. And even that's what coaching does in the end. It just helps you question, what is your limited look at this? What is your limited decision making tree that you're making? What is your limited perspective that is has you on the path of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again, hoping to to get different results. That's what people come to these programs or come to therapy or come to coaching about because they keep getting the same results. They keep running into themselves over and over again and they don't can't get any traction and they can't get their arms around this thing. And If you go into a program or sit at one of those meetings and are willing to understand the word surrender, that we're really not in charge of it all. This ego is not (laughs) all-knowing. That there may be another way and that we may have to humble ourselves to it and be willing to try something different, which is really scary uh, and is humbling. Um, but it is also ultimately freeing. And for my own addictions, really, I worked through most of that stuff through therapy and my own Al-Anon. You know, once I started really getting my own ego, seeing my ego perspective around um, my codependent relationships with other people, um, it you know, it, it freed me from needing to, you know, and I was done with the drugs. I mean, I got bored. I was done. You just feeling. got to that point yourself. You you didn't go to rehab. You just said, you yeah. know, I've had enough of this. Oh, yeah. And I had was having such horrible panic attacks um, that I couldn't tolerate it anymore. I couldn't tolerate putting any chemicals into my body that would trigger that. I was already in this horrific, heightened, um, you know, sympathetic fight or flight reaction Mm -hmm. that uh, anything putting anything in my body was just a terrifying thought. So really my panic attacks um, saved me from my own addiction. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to reiterate that I will have links to these anonymous organizations uh, in the show notes on the episode page to Al-Anon, AA, NAOA, Adult Children of Alcoholics. And these are all free meetings that are open to everyone. And I highly encourage people to check it out if you don't know where else to turn, if you need help. Uh, they're available. They will welcome you with open arms. So thank yeah. you for sharing uh, your experience yeah. with that. So we talked about your book. Did we, we really didn't, I I mentioned your book in the intro. You wrote a memoir. I did. And it took you a good year or so to write, but you (laughs) began by performing it, It, right? It it took me 15 years. Um, 15 years, okay. um, When, before I went to Pacifica, like I mentioned earlier, I, I got on a stage and did a solo show. And it made my dad uncomfortable. And so I I knew that I wasn't going to pursue a solo show career. And that's why I went to Pacifica, because I was like, all right, I'm going to find a different way to be on a stage and communicate to people about the human journey. And at Pacifica, part of the reason I chose Pacifica was because you could do art there um, as part of your thesis, as part of your dissertation, as part of your um, classwork, Mm -hmm. some has allowed you to do artwork, painting, sculpting, storytelling, dance, whatever. Um, and so 
And with the help of Pacifica, when you become a therapist, when you're trained to become a therapist, part of what you need to learn to do is to piece together your own narrative, to understand your own pathologies so that you don't project them and make them part of your part of the that safe space we were talking about that creates space for others so that you're conscious of when your stuff is triggered your mother issues your father issues your your own traumas and so you can get your own support around it so that you don't flood the space and your client with your shit and um so part of it was really I used some of my solo sh- I used the script of my solo show actually as my essay to get into Pacifica, my first solo show, which was called Driven to Distraction. And, um, and then at Pacifica, I learned about these narratives, one of which being the heroine's journey and just the general narrative of how we hold our own stories in the world. And then, um, but I put the solo show stuff. And then when I came out of Pacifica, I started writing stories and doing story essays, uh, personal essays around LA. It became part of an extremely amazing and vibrant community here in LA. Um, and really felt like I had found my people and actually kind of felt like I'd really found my art form. It was really great. And I would do these like six to 10 minute stories of different moments in my life. Some I'd pulled out of my first solo show. Some I started writing more, more deeply about uh, other things, but they were all about my past, mm-hmm. all about what shaped me. Um, and also about my ever an ongoing uh, spiritual curiosity about the numinous, about the divine, about my relationship with the sacred through my Buddhism or through this understanding that I was getting through Jungian and imaginal psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had a bunch of stories that I would tell and they were great. I loved them all. And, um, and then my dad died in 2008 and, um, and it became immediately clear to me that as an artist, as a creative soul, um, that there was now room on the planet for me to really step into my full voice and to pursue what I'd always wanted to pursue. And I, um, met, uh, a bunch of comedians who really were there for me and refathered me in a very profound way. I'd been remothered at Pacifica, but after my dad's death, I really felt there was a refathering going on. I didn't see it in the moment, but I can see it so clearly now. It just happened naturally. It did. It did. I became very close with uh, Gary Shandling, who, ah. if you've seen the documentary about him, you, a lot of people talk about his mentoring. He was a practicing Buddhist, which I did not know until I met him. And he and I started having long lunches and deep lunches. And he was the first person I could admit to that, um, you know, even though as a daughter, I was devastated that my father was dead. My father had pretty serious conject, uh, uh, heart disease um, for many decades. Mm-hmm. It's- no shock that my dad was had died at 71. But um, but as a daughter, even though I was devastated by that, my soul um, felt freed by it, as many of us do when a parent leaves. Yeah, um, we suddenly can occupy a lot more space on the planet. And when you're the daughter of someone who occupies a particular kind of space in the on the planet in the culture, it's a particular type of freedom. Um, although my father was more actually in my life than ever after he died because of his career. Um, and so I started, and then I met another gentleman, Jeffrey Tambor, who I was taking his master acting class in who knew Gary. And then another gentleman, Paul Provenza, who you mentioned, uh, the, his showtime show, the green room, I became a producer on it. And Paul, uh, became a dramaturg with me and helped me shape my story. I, I, at first, I didn't want to do a solo show. I thought it was crazy. I didn't want to be my father's daughter on a stage. I didn't want to tour around the country. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> Tell stories. But I, um, what had happened was uh, another friend of mine, and I, I'm sorry I'm name dropping, but That's these okay. are <laughs> men who absolutely really yeah. treasures in my life. A gentleman yeah. named Louis Black, a comedian named Louis Black. I became friends with him, and he invited me on a cruise ship where he had a bunch of comedians on and he had 400 or 600 if you lewis black fans who were on the cruise ship with us and they at night they had this lounge 
uh, the space where they were doing comedy shows every night. And he said, you know, I want you and your husband, Bob, to come on the ship with us. But I, and, uh, and, and, and I, you, the ship, the, you can come on the cruise free. I just need you to do one thing. I need you to do an hour and 15 minutes during the day. I need a couple of day events. He says, you've got a bunch of family stories. He goes, just play some of your dad's videos and, and tell some of your family stories. And this was early on. This was like 2010 oh, or maybe okay. like 20, 2009, 20, I think it was 2010. Mm-hmm. And, um, it might have been 2009, November 2009. And I'm like, okay, sure. You know, oh my God. Yes, I'm going on a cruise ship with Lewis Black and his friends for, you know, 10 days. <laughs> right. Sign me up now. Yeah. Uh, and so I did this. So I think it was day two. I play, I, I like found some videos off these like best of George Carlin DVDs. And I picked, I don't know, maybe seven, eight of them, put them in order, chronological order. And I just would play a video and tell a family story from the era and play a video and tell a family story. And at the end, uh, I mean, people had laughed and there wasn't a, a freaking dry eye in the house. And people were saying to me, you have to do this. You have to go tell these stories. Oh. And at the moment, I was like, but I'm just finding who Kelly is. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, do I really want to walk through the fire of being George Carlin's daughter in public? And that's what Paul Provenza presented me with. He said... When I decided to do this, he said, why are you doing this? And I said, if I don't look the beast in the eye, which is this legacy, this shadow, this invisibility I felt my entire life, if I don't show up in the world and say, yes, I'm his daughter, here's my story. Uh, And my story is told with a lot of love and kindness, but a lot of truth telling also. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, I'm, you know, it's no mommy dearest type of thing, certainly. Um, but I said, if I don't walk through this and allow the full light of his light to shine on me and to find my way through that, I will be battling this for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will, I will be either dodging it or chasing after it forever in an unconscious way. And I really saw it as this incredible, well, that Virgin's Promise narrative. I didn't see it at, at that time uh-huh. like that. I knew in the my bones, Laura, that this was my sole work to do now. And at the same time, I learned a craft. I got to travel around the country. I entertained Everyone from small venues to 500 atheists at an atheist convention. There you go. <laughs> um, and I um, got to go to New York and do it in a solo show festival at the Cherry Lane Theater off Broadway, mm-hmm. which is my New York is my father's town. So yeah. I got to do my work in my father's city um, and live in the city for a month and do that. And and from that gig, an editor at St. Martin's Press came and saw my show because her boss had heard me on a podcast mm-hmm. telling a story. And within five days, I had a book deal. Mm. So you turned that show into a book, but I'm sure much longer and oh, yeah. took yeah, you my- a long time to write. It took, I had a year. I had actually nine months to write it. I had exactly nine months to write it. And of course I laughed. I'm like, of course it's nine months. I mean, come on. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And I had a great editor and I had a great scaffolding because of my solo show. Um, I knew what all the beats were, but I had to go much deeper, obviously. And I had to include a lot of things that there was absolutely no room for in the solo show because the solo show right. was very much me playing videos of my dad and letting them echo and reflect on the fa- the parallel family life that was going on, whereas the book really is my memoir, mm-hmm. and um, and I feel that St. Martin's Press marketed it wrongly because they oh. marketed it in such a way um, that they like the initial marketing, even if you see it on Amazon, it says you know this take on George Carlin's life or something like that. Oh. It's not- it's my story. It's yeah. my memoir. It's me. It's my parents meeting in 1960 all the way. And I was born in 63 all the way to my father's death in 2008 and a little after just uh, spreading his ashes. 
Um, it is my story through the, it is a daughter's story dancing with the journey that we all dance with in how we work with what we're given Mm -hmm. through our parents, through, through our own family dysfunction, you know, and I, I really humanize my, my parents and humanize my father. My father never revealed his personal life on stage. He was not Richard Pryor. Um, he did not talk about his personal addictions. He did not talk about his family. He did not talk about his horrible relationship with his mother. (laughs) He did not talk about the abandonment that he had as a young boy because he never had a father. He never talked about any of that. Um, he wrote about it in his autobiography last words, but we, he never published it while he was alive. We ended up publishing it posthumously in, in 2009. So wait, he wrote that and it sort of sat around and then it's at his computer. Yes. Oh. He wrote it with a ghost writer, Tony Hendra, not a ghost writer. Tony Hendra's name is on it, but yes, he wrote it with someone to help him shape it. It sat in his computer. And had you talked about it when he was still alive about publishing it or you didn't know about I, it? I knew he was doing it. I'd been interviewed for it. Okay. Um, but I knew his stance. You know, when I did my first solo show, he said to me, and I write, I write about this in my book, um, he said, I gave him the script to my solo show, and I didn't hear from him for weeks. And my mother was dead, and my father was my entire universe, mm-hmm. and I knew something was up, and I was terrified because I had just finally put myself out as yeah. – artist I knew I was in my art form. And he said to me, um, (laughs) I called him finally, I said, Ed, um, have you read my script? And he said, Yeah, we need to talk at at your therapist's office. So I knew it was going to be a tough conversation. And what ended up being in the conversation, though, was he said to me, um, I'm an artist and you're an artist and I would never ask you to change a single word of this. Um, But I can't be there in the audience. I have too much guilt and pain about this time. And I can't be the father sitting in the audience that everyone's going to be turning their head and look. And, um, and he also said, um, and, and if you were really feeling all of this pain and all of this, why couldn't you come to me? And I said, well, there it is right there is I couldn't come to you because our dance was um, and it's a big theme in my book. My dad would ask, how are you? And I would say, fine. Yeah. And he would say, great. Yeah. And, and we would get on with our day. And that was our personal family dysfunction of denial around everything. Yeah. My, my mother's addiction a little bit. My, my dad and I talked a lot about my mother's stuff and tried to get her th- and helped get her through it. But when it came to me and my pain and my confusions, I did not feel like I had a safe haven in my own family to talk about. Yeah. I could relate to that. And um, I, I do identify with you a lot, relate to you a lot. Our fathers were close in age. I think they were born only one year apart. My father was born in Manhattan too. Mm. And my dad passed away in 2002. Yeah. And Mm. I often wonder about telling my personal stories, Mm. which I don't do. Um, My mom is still alive. My brother, he has two uh, young daughters. And I don't really have permission to talk about my father, or my relationship with my father. Yeah. I, I can't do that yet. Yeah, I, I so get it, Laura. And people who do do it while their parents are alive, I take my hat off to them. Mm. Um, you know, as Anne Lamott says, uh, your story is your story. No one can take it from you. It is your, you have every right to tell your story. And if people want to be depicted better in your story, they should have um, they should have acted better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or what? I'm really fucking up that quote. No, that, that that's a great that's point. Quote. You know, it's like it's not your fault mm-hmm. that they you know, did what they did, and, and your and your life is your life, and you have every right to your narrative. And and there's time. You know, the, here's the tricky part about narrative, and this is the tricky part. 
about the work I do with clients and and the th- there's a therapeutic part to telling your story and to claiming the victim stance. There's a really important point in therapy and healing where you have to say, I am the victim and this is my rage and this is my pain. And if there is a victim, there is a perpetrator. And who is the perpetrator? And making them accountable, maybe not in real life, you can't making them accountable, but at least making them accountable in the therapeutic setting and saying, you know, it really wasn't okay that this person did this. Mm-hmm. Um, owning a, a position of, 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 of ethics and, mo- and morality, a st- there has to be a moral stance within ourselves that we gave up at some point in order to protect, protect ourselves and our parents. Um, so that's an important stance inside the therapeutic vessel and in within our own therapeutic journey, whether you're doing therapy or not, is to own the victim stance and to, and to see the perpetrator and to understand that. But you cannot stay there. And as an artist, you cannot write from that perspective. It is not healthy for you. From it is the not- victim perspective. Correct. Right. You must be able to move on and find compassion. Yes. Every single participant in the drama. And you must be able to stand outside the drama. And that's why I work with narratives with my clients. You must be able to stand outside your own drama. And sometimes you'll move back into it and you'll take on the different roles and and feel them and feel the energy and feel the pain or feel the joy or whatever it is. But then you have to stand back outside the drama, which is taking a stance outside the ego stance and saying, here is a human journey. Here is a human family working this stuff out. Here is all of humanity. That's what art does. And and the beautiful thing about art is and when you're making it and what Paul would always say to me in my when I was writing my solo show And my editor would always say to me when I was writing the memoir is, you do have to get specific into your story Mm -hmm. as specific as possible, because the more specific you get, the more it activates the imagination of the listener or the watcher or the reader so that they can place themselves into your story so that it then becomes their story. Because that's what we do as audience as readers, as listeners, is where am I in this story? How does this fit me so that you walk through the story thinking, oh, if I had a parent like that, Mm -hmm. when my parent was like that, what choice would I make? Or what choice did I make? Would I be able to escape that? Would I would I have chosen that husband she chose at the beginning at 18? You know, Mm -hmm. And we put ourselves in it. And that's when it then becomes the human story and the universal story. And now we're having a conversation with the collective. Yeah. Yeah. And so our personal stories are never our stories. That's what I tell my writing friends and my writing clients when they have the urge to write their stories. As I say, you must write it because we all need your story. We do. And thank you for writing your story. Again, the name of your book is A Carlin Home Companion, Growing Up with George. And I will have a link to that in the show notes. And um, before we come to the end of our time here today, I wanted to ask you about today. Here we are, July 15th, 2020, in the middle of a global pandemic. Yeah, it's redundant. But how has your life changed? Um, so my work has changed almost in zero ways. I work online already. Uh, Mm -hmm. My program is online. All my coaching is through Zoom. I'm very familiar with Zoom. I've been teaching on Zoom for three years. I used to have a mindfulness meditation thing called Sunday Unplug, which I don't do live anymore, but it's archived in the world and it's available. But, um, so that hasn't changed. I've actually gotten some new clients during the pandemic. I thought for sure everyone was just going to, but it's actually a really great time for people to do personal work. Yeah, (laughs) sure is. And really, and really that, you know, because the biggest question of my inquiry to potential clients is, 
you know, who do you want to be in the next chapter of your life? And really the collective question is, who do we all want to be in the next chapter of our life? So, um, so that's not changed. Um, but, um, it's, it's been intense. Um, all my anxiety came back the first six weeks. Uh, I actually had a panic attack during that time. I hadn't had a panic attack in years. Um, I've learned a lot about, um, how much, Oh, first I was in bliss. So I had anxiety, but I was also in bliss because I have a big commitment to slow living. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're too, we're too much uh, plugging ourselves into the machine of capitalism. We've lost the soul of work. We've lost the rhythm of life. And so when the whole state and country, or at least in California has shut down, um, for those six weeks, a part of me was in heaven because it was like, oh, yay. Now people are actually getting to see like, oh, I hear bird song every morning mm-hmm. and there's quiet on my street. Like there was a, uh, an idyllicness to it all, which was really beautiful. So I was very excited about that part. And then um, what I've also learned, though, is that how there's a lot of kind of then a stripping away of distraction that consumerism and capitalism and our oversaturated media lives, which is still obviously a problem because we're all turning to media right now. Right. But when you don't have all of that stuff poking at you all day um, and you're not an essential worker, I mean, obviously essential workers are living a very different existence. Yes. Right. Like, um, and obviously people who businesses went away or have, gone you know decline during this time are living a very different way but i think we're i know i'm getting that i just see how much distraction i've eliminated in my life and therefore how much i have to really tend to my mind um that my neurosis becomes front and center um you know anxiety obsessive thoughts obsessive thinking um and then about Four weeks ago, I hit a about a 20 day, very, very dark despair, could not shake it. Um, And just knew I was just in some sort of kind of falling apart of, you know, the kind of the underworld stuff that was happening. And, um, and actually had the thought halfway through, maybe I need meds. I'd never felt except for my for grieving my mother. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes in my twenties, some, some dark kind of clinical depression type of stuff, but it was more situational and as this is too. Um, but I could not shake this darkness. Um, and then I, you know, used some of the tools I've been using, you know, the active imagination stuff. I've been reading a lot of red book stuff, a lot of Hillman lately, um, and holding the space in that and just, being with it all and and doing some painting and some drawing some movement um to just get out of that kind of solving fixing place and just letting the energy through me and um and i've been out of it now for about two weeks and back into some sort of productivity feeling and connection to that have some work to do this month teaching at chautauqua later in august and doing a dream tending session and things like that. So, but, um, you know, part of me, the depth psychologist is excited about these times because humanity is going through a profound shift and we have been for a while. Um, and as a human being walking through it, it's really, really hard. It's, it's not, you know, no matter how much we want to sit on our little Jungian or, spiritual cushions and look at it from the big bird's eye view and say, you know, this is a turning point or this is a transformational point. Um, But transformation and turning point means a lot of mushy liminal chaos and being a human being with a nervous system um, that chaos uh, triggers all day long is no fun. And so I'm a lot of what I teach in women on the verge is self care and self soothing body really connecting to body and doing self 
work. And I've had to just ramp it up a million fold for myself. And it's really what I try to do online now and talk to people about. And I try not to add to the chaos so much and try to, to know that, you know, sometimes you just need an Oreo cookie and a jigsaw puzzle and um, a season of Love Island. <laughs> yeah, we can only take so much reality, right? You really can. And, you know, and some of the, 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 the quote unquote unhealthy distraction is okay. But make sure you're also doing some practices that help your body move from sympathetic to parasympathetic. Um, you know, whether it's yoga nidra or meditation or breathing, um, or whatever it is, um, uh, find some practices and make sure you're giving your body a chance to, um, to ground itself in the parasympathetic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're all undergoing change and change requires chaos. So, uh, we've got to do what we can to stay afloat. Uh, and- yeah, and being kind to each other mm-hmm. is the least we can do. It's the mm-hmm. easiest. It's sometimes the hardest some days, but it is yes. the it is the first step, you know. So that's why I wear a mask because I'm in it with everyone else and every person I come across, no matter what, on media or in person, I just try to send them loving kindness, compassion first because without kindness, we're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's what uh, we didn't get into your Buddhism practice. But that's what the Tibetan Buddhists taught me um, is compassion. Yeah. And that wasn't something that was talked about very much, um, or encouraged. um, But that is something that I think that concept really saved me is learning compassion and practicing it. And I don't always do it perfectly, no, but no, no. I remind myself to come back to it. And yeah. compassion with yourself yes. also in those moments yeah. when it's like you, you find yourself beating yourself up and go, oh, yeah, how about some compassion here first? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you for being here today and for everything you do for sharing your life um, with all of us. Um, Really appreciate it. I'm going to read the outro now, unless there was anything you wanted to add. No, I just want to thank you for this space, Laura, and also thank you for the space you provide for the Jungian discussions and topics. Um, you are one of my favorite things on Twitter because you connect that world to my world. And so thank you for all the deep diving you've been doing with all these amazing minds over the last few years on this podcast. It's a rich, rich resource for me. And I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you so much, Kelly. I'm glad we found each other on Twitter. It was a while ago. It was yep. quite a few years ago. Yep. So I'm really glad that we're connected there. Yeah, me too. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or tune in. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. So with special thanks to Dave Bregman and Diane Braden, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to a special quarantine edition of Speaking of Jung. <laughs>